good morning and a very warm welcome to all the viewers of CA Club India. Today we have a very special guest with us, CA Manoj Fadnes, the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Sir, it's a matter of huge honor and pride to be here with you and sharing some moments with you. Thank you, Mr. Anjani. It is also my privilege and honor to join this uh, chat with you and uh, through you meet and interact with all the viewers of this CA Club India. I know you have been doing a great job for the profession and for all the professionals and I'm very happy to be with you today morning. Uh, sir, first of all, uh, congratulations that you have been elected as the president of ICEI. Thank you. To begin with a round of conversation, I would want to know what is your roadmap, your vision for this particular year for the institute, uh, members and students alike? Well, you see the council has already set in a vision for the profession and for the institute and which is a long-term vision. So it is to ensure that collectively on a year-to-year -year basis we see how we improve the quality of services which we render to the society, how we can improve the various uh, teaching methodologies for our CA students. So these are long-term objectives so that as a profession we should remain relevant for the country as a whole. And in that larger vision we draw out an action plan and uh, then we have the priorities on a year-to-year -year basis which are aligned with the national priorities. So this year as uh, the NDAS, that is the Indian Accounting Standards with converged, converged with IFRS has become applicable from 1st of April as per the roadmap set out by the Honorable Finance Minister. So these becomes our priorities in that context. But we have so many other things like education and training, a new system which we are bringing out for students. So they come within the larger vision which the council has set. So as you've just spoken about IFRS and the conversion of Indian accounting standards, uh, in fact our readers would be interested, our viewers would be interested in knowing what are the steps which the institute has actually taken or is taking in ensuring that this huge task is uh, made a reality and there is the implementation of it which happens. Well, uh, you will be happy to know that uh, the institute has already completed its due process. The standards, the Indian standards conversed with IFRS have been already hosted by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs on, the, on its website. So the detailed process has been completed. And uh, what is really important uh, is that when the Honorable Finance Minister in his maiden budget speech on 10th of July mentioned that the Indian corporates will adopt the international standards with effect from 1st of April 2015. Now from 1st, from 10th of July to 18th of February, uh, when these standards were notified by the ministry, in less than around six months time, we finished a lot of work in the institute. Our accounting standards board completed the entire convergence with the international standards as they existed on 1st of January 2014. And they had, they brought out the exposure drafts. They had a lot of comments on it. Each comments were carefully considered. And thereafter, they were placed before the council. The council placed it before the National Accounting, uh, the National Accounting, uh, National Committee on Accounting Standards, NACAS. And finally, NACAS has given it to the central government. So from 10th July to 18th February, a lot of work was done by the institute through its various uh, bodies and we got enormous uh, cooperation from our members at large in terms who, of those who came forward, uh, formed study groups, gave comments to the institute. I think as a profession we have done a, done a job which I am really proud about and uh, we have today given these standards to the government and the government is, is making them applicable from 1st of April so that the Indian corporates can have the same set of principles for the purpose of preparation, presentation of financial statements as are accepted worldwide. So this is a contribution of our profession and the institute to the country as a whole. Right. Uh, moving forward, the union budget was just presented on the 28th of February and I'm sure uh, you must be busy decoding the larger picture in that. Uh, my question to you would be that what were your expectations and post budget as a common man, what are your views or perceptions about the budget? B, as the head of the most reputed financial institute of uh, this country and perhaps one of the best in the world, what are your views about the budget? 
Uh, I'll take the last part. Taught perhaps the best in the world. I believe our institute is the best in the world. Uh, besides that, I mean, uh, as each one of us has expectations from the budget, uh, well, we have a lot of, and we are all justified in having our own expectations from the budget. But as I see the budget, it is a budget which is a growth-oriented budget. It is a budget which will give a long-term uh, uh, direction to the way the economy is to grow. And uh, I'm very happy that the Honorable Finance Minister has put up a target of 8.5% for the growth of GDP in the times to come. See, we are a 1 billion plus country. We have more than 1.25 billion. And we have a lot of challenges in the country. We have a lot of infrastructure which is required to be developed. We have a lot of people who need primary education and basic health facilities. In such an environment to plan a growth of 8.5% growth in GDP is a big challenge. So what the government has done is it has put its resources for infrastructure development. And once you have a good infrastructure, then it kickstarts the economy. And uh, then uh, the, when the economy grows, you have more jobs being created, more employment being generated. So these are some very positive aspects of this budget. Even on the tax side, if you will see an indirect taxes, you will find that a lot of long-term reforms are being brought in by the government. The finance minister also said that GST would be a game changer. Yes. And next year, from 1st of April, GST would be implemented. So, uh, again, the role of the institute in the implementation. Yes. Uh, as the Honorable Finance Minister in December when he placed the Constitutional Amendment Bill before the Parliament and he remarked that GST is going to be the single largest tax reforms in the country since independence. So, you can gauge from the fact that once you have a law, a uniform law with respect to goods and services being uh, implemented all across the country, it will bring a lot of developments and a lot of good features along with it. While the cost uh, of the tax to the end consumer uh, would not be high, at the same time the revenues for the state and central governments will increase. And in that uh, scenario, the institute is playing a very proactive role with the finance ministry to ensure that the GST is properly implemented the way the Honorable Finance Minister and the government and the parliamentarians have in mind. And uh, we are also in the process of approaching all state governments to assist the state governments in a proper uniform implementation of the GST. So we are offering our services to the individual state governments also and I am sure uh, we will be able to succeed in our endeavour with respect to the state governments so that uh, we have a GST law which is uniform in the country mm -hmm. and uh, there are a lot of procedures to be decided, a lot of rules required to be made. So our endeavour would be to help the state governments in uh, this direction. Right. Now the reduction uh, or the gradual reduction of 5% in the corporate taxes bring, bringing down to 25% yes. and the increase in the service tax yes. uh, to a consolidated 14%. Yes. Uh, so, here at, we are reducing the direct taxes, at the same time the government has increased the quantum of indirect taxes, uh, thus increasing the burden. Yes. So, uh, how do you think, what would be the balancing act? Well, uh, if you look at the direct taxes, the, what the Honourable Finance Minister mentioned is that the tax rate will be reduced from 30% to 25% in a phased manner over a period of four years. Certain exemptions which are being given will also be withdrawn over a period of time. So. This is a very important message which the finance minister has given with respect to having a tax system which is uh, consistent and he has given a long term direction to the uh, uh, corporates as to what kind of tax reforms they can expect. So while he has said that the tax rate will be reduced from 30 to 25 percent to bring it in line with what is there in the Asian uh, region and uh, uh, make the Indian corporates competitive by having a lesser tax regime. At the same time, selective exemptions being given also need to be withdrawn. So you can't have both the things. So And also the fact that he has mentioned a period of uh, four years gives a certainty to the tax structure. So it is not that, so the corporates know what they should expect in a period of four years, which is a midterm uh, and a very uh, useful time horizon. Your second question with respect to GST, yes, the service tax particularly, that the rate of uh, service tax is increased from 12% to 14%. Now that we are heading towards GST, 
and in the GST the tax rate is estimated to be around 16 percent. So it is a step in that direction. If you are going to have GST being implemented in the country from 1st of April 2016 and in 2014 you add 12 percent, then in 15 you have 14 percent and in 2016 you go to 16 percent. So I think that is also a gradual increase in the tax rate from 12 to 16 percent. It is not suddenly increased from 12 to 16, but you have one year that is the current year where you made it 14 and then from 14 to 16 percent. I think we need to look at it from that angle. Uh, moving away from the budget, it was a pride moment when uh, the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India was nominated as the first professional institute yes. uh, for the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan mission by the Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi. Uh, the role the institute is playing and will be playing. Uh, yes, uh, I, I fully agree with you. It was really a matter of delight, pride and honour when uh, the Honourable Prime Minister, uh, I, I must say on his own, uh, took the institute as one of the partners in a very large vision which the Honourable Prime Minister has for a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. And uh, we have been working in that uh, even before the announcement when the government came out with the three schemes uh, Swachh Bharat, Jandhan and Make in India. Right from that point of time, we had uh, prepared our internal documents on these schemes and we had circulated that to our branches and we had started the move. And when the, uh, when the Honorable Prime Minister took us in uh, with him, we felt very delighted and motivated. And uh, today we have a special committee for corporate social responsibilities which is being headed by my immediate past president, uh, Sri K. Raghu. Uh, who is chairing this co committee. So the idea th is that we bring out our CSR initiatives in line with what the government has and uh, uh, carry out all these activities in a proper and uh, uh, proper manner and implement them through our 147 branches and five regional councils. And as you know, we have 26 chapters across the world. So we would like the uh, foreign chapters of the institute also to spread the good message which the government is carrying out and where institute is partnering with the central government. So a lot of things we have planned up un under the CSR activities for the current year. Just taking this forward, in fact, in the annual prize giving, we had uh, the Honorable Minister Piyush Goel, yes. Minister of Power and Coal. Uh, he had also appealed to the chartered accountants to come up and perhaps give the render services pro bono yes. in ensuring that all the toilets which have been constructed in that project that chartered accountants can come up and see whether the implementation is being done properly, the funds are going everywhere. So on a lighter load, I would say that uh, suddenly we see chartered accountants everywhere, yeah. you know, presenting the rail budget and you have uh, presenting the power and coal and I think it's, it's the new aspirations which students and young people are getting to right. become chartered accountants. Yes. And at the same time, considering that we are being given so much of importance, uh, it also shows that chartered accountants have also a very important social role to play, sure. not just the economic role to play in the, in the, in the growth of the country. Sure. What are your views uh, on chartered accountants' social role? Well, uh, you are quite right. Uh, we are a large body and uh, as chartered accountants, uh, the chartered accountants are highly respected in the society and uh, therefore it becomes important that as a profession, we give back to the society what we have earned and received, the kind of uh, fame and uh, uh, the kind of respect which the profession has earned from the society. So it becomes our duty to see that we contribute back to the society. And uh, you have very rightly pointed out that we have uh, very eminent personalities from our profession who are occupying very key positions and as a profession we are proud of them. We are proud of the fact that one of the members of our profession presented the union rail budget. And we have uh, Sri uh, Piyush Goelji heading a very, very important uh, industry ministry portfolio uh, with respect to power energy. So uh, we are partnering with the government as the Honorable Minister for Power Piyush Ji mentioned that uh, there is a lot of CSR activities being carried out by his ministry in terms of construction of toilets to give a clean India. So he has uh, appealed to the profession that uh, we should come forward and pro bono provide our services for the purpose of verification of the funds so that the funds go in the right place and right, uh, uh, right objectives are achieved out of this large spending. Now what we have done is we have uh, put up an uh, announcement on our website uh, requesting our professional firms to come forward and empanel themselves for the, this activity. And I am very happy that we are getting a very fast and very, uh, uh, very good 
response from our membership and lot many firms are coming forward from all over the country to empanel themselves for this activity and which then they will carry out uh, pro bono as I said uh, free of cost for the society and render their services to the society. So this we are doing at individual level at the uh, at a larger level at branch levels we have more uh, social activities being carried out and we are creating more awareness even amongst the students so that they should also have this message clear in their mind that they have to also contribute to the society. Right. We're talking about students, uh, so uh, I heard it somewhere that the CA examinations are going to get more tougher. Uh, and also that uh, there is a lot of revamping going on in the course and curriculum of the CA. I think uh, Mr. Arun Jetli, the Honorable Finance Minister, has also played his part in ensuring that wealth tax is removed from the direct taxes curriculum. So, so there are two views to it. Some students are uh, saying that we are losing 10 marks and some are saying that the curriculum has become shorter. Uh, to move on to the larger picture, the institute is now planning to uh, restructure the curriculum for the students. Yes. Uh, can you please share some of yes. uh, those? So I, I agree, the CA exams are tough. And uh, they have always been tough. When I appeared for exams, my principal used to tell me that even in his good old days, the exams were tough. And I qualified around, around 28 years ago. So even that point of time, the exams were tough. And even today, the exams remain tough. But the point is, uh, a student who has a passion to study and who is a who, who is hardworking student and who puts in his mind and energy in our course curriculum, I'm sure he will pass the exams. So we want uh, people to, and when we say at the final level, what we have is an expert degree of knowledge. So he must really have that expert degree of knowledge. If he has that expert degree of knowledge, he will become a chartered accountant. Insofar as the course curriculum is concerned, uh, every around 10 years, the council has been revamping the entire course so that the course becomes relevant for the next period of 10 years. We had this uh, activity carried out in a big way around 2004-2005 and in 2006 we launched the new course curriculum which starts with CPT and the present course as you are well aware of. Now in 2014-15 again the council has uh, started this activity, in fact it started in 2013, uh, it got the momentum last year 2014. And we carried out an online survey, we had uh, meetings with stakeholders, we had meetings with our professional colleagues to see what is the changes, if any, in some courses are required. And where we need to uh, align our course again with what is the international best practices which are happening. So just to share one or two quick things is, uh, today we talk about an open book exam system. Right. Now we don't have that kind of an open book exam system in our current course curriculum. Now we are planning to move towards that. When we have an open book exam system, a final CA student can carry the bare text act of say income tax act or corporate laws or any other laws or maybe the accounting standards, auditing standards will allow him to carry the bare act or the bare standards and we will put questions to him so that he can refer to the standards but the questions will be on his uh, on the application of that those provisions on the analytical understanding of those questions on his conceptual understanding of those subjects so that we are in a better position to test the student now i must also say that we are conducting exams for more than 1 lakh students for final and we are doing it at more than 350 centers uh, within the country and we have few centers outside the country so to carry out this kind of a reform is going to be a major challenge even for the institute and for our examination system. But that is where we are heading for so that we can have a better testing methodologies for the students. So we don't want to ask a simple question, what, are this, what is this provision? He has a, a handset, he has iPad, he has laptop, he has internet connectivity and he can always go and uh, find out the relevant provisions. So what is important is his understanding of those provisions. So we are trying to bring in st such structural changes and reforms in our education system. There will be no major changes. So the uh, curriculum, uh, the articleship period will be of three years as it was in the past, but our examination system will improve. Some of the subjects which are more relevant may be introduced, something which are less relevant will be removed. We have announced on our website the draft scheme and uh, I would request all the viewers to kindly send their comments till 31st of March to us. We will be very happy to receive your comments and I can assure you every comment that you that we receive 
we have a system where each comment is properly analyzed and then the final decision is taken. So this process is on today and we expect to complete the entire process in 2015. It's a long process. We have to go to the government again, put out a final scheme for public comments and then finally get government approvals, council approvals. It takes time. So we have targeted for 2016 for the launch of the new course curriculum. Uh, another thing, there has been a paradigm shift uh, in the CAs from practice to jobs. Yes. And the institute has also launched a young mentorship program yes. for the young chartered accountants. Yes. So specifically this question goes uh, from the young chartered accountants that what are the steps being taken and uh, to ensure that there are more numbers going in practice. Well, uh, as the economy actually grows, uh, we find that more people will go from practice to job, uh, to industry. So if you take a scenario 50 years back when the Indian industry was not so well developed, so people were coming more in practice as, the, as compared to the number of people who would get jobs in good industries. But uh, over a period of time, as you see the economy growing, the industrialization taking place, there's a good uh, growth in the corporate sector, there's more professionalism in corporate sector, and the pay scales are all, have also been uh, uh, considerably enhanced. So the, worldwide, there's a trend that when the economy grows, more people will come out of uh, public practice and go to industries. And even those who go in public practice, so they have to ensure, because today is a time of specialization. Now, there are different uh, subjects which we have. We have, say, direct taxes, indirect taxes, within direct taxes. Again, there are different areas of specialization, business taxation, international taxation, appellate work, original work, compliance work. So people are specializing in each niche areas. When you start specializing in each areas, then it is not possible for one person to render so many services. So what we have is uh, people coming together, practicing in groups, people taking up jobs in professional firms. So that is the kind of uh, paradigm shift, as you rightly mentioned, which is also taking place in our profession. Now, insofar as the young members are concerned, this is a new committee which we came out with last year. Our objective was that a person who is just joined the profession and uh, he needs some degree of mentorship. If he would like to know whether I should take up a job, I should go for a public practice or should I go for a, a job in civil services or should I look out for an overseas uh, uh, career. So these are normal challenges which a young member is bound to face. And uh, there are so many opportunities and options available to him. So he needs guidance with respect to what career path he should choose. So that is one of the objectives of this committee to provide the right kind of mentorship to the young members. Second is a young member who comes in uh, public practice. Now we can't have a system that we give him some work or we tell the government or we tell the regulators he's a young member, please give him this work or please empanel him because it's a free market, you know, it's a capital economy. It is where the best has to survive. So in that sense, uh, there will always be a tendency of each of us, even we, when we uh, utilize the services of other professionals, we might like to go to a doctor who has some experience. If I have to get myself operated, I'll go to a surgeon who has done such surgeries in the past. You know, this is what all of us do. So what we have thought is, the young members have their own challenges. So we should help them, handhold them, give them the knowledge, give them the expertise, give them the experience and uh, make them strong enough to uh, fight these challenges, overcome these challenges. So this committee is more of a mentorship committee to help the young members, be them in public practice or be they in service or whatever they wish to do. But for the first five years of their membership of the institute, up to age of say around 30 is what we are thinking about. So we would like to handhold them, guide them, help them in whatever way they wish to and see that they, can, they have their own strengths. So a young member is more techno savvy, he can, uh, he can be a better presenter, his communication skills will be better, but he lacks experience. So we help him with those areas where he is lacking so that he can compete in, this, uh, uh, in the profession. So uh, they say every good thing has to come to an end. Yeah. Uh, so last but not the least, your message to young chartered accountants, students and all the members of CA Club India who are excited and eagerly watching you over this interview. 
Uh, well, uh, as the uh, president of the institute, my earnest appeal to each member of the institute is whatever service he is rendering, if, be it consultancy, be it tax, be it an attest function, it is important that we render our professional services in the best qualitative manner. And uh, as all of you would agree with me, there is no end to excellence. Excellence is not a uh, destination, you know, it is something which has to be improvised upon. So even whatever best you are doing, there is also scope to do even something further better than that. So as a profession, each one of us individually must work hard to improve the quality of our services. It is generally felt that if I get some big audits or some extraordinary work, I will do it in a very nice way and I will get good results. But friends, believe me, it is the ordinary work done in an extraordinary manner which brings the extraordinary results. This is the message I need to communicate that whatever work we are doing, if I am filing income tax returns, I am carrying out an audit of an education institution, I am carrying out an audit of a religious trust or I am carrying out an audit of a bank or NBFC or any complex institution, the quality of the services are important and we must as a, as a profession endeavor to improve the quality of our services. Once the quality keeps on improving, friends, there is no end to the professional opportunities which will be available to us and the profession will continue to become more and more glorious in times to come. So with these great words that every ordinary work should be done in an extraordinary manner and that excellence is not a destination, it's a gradual process of improvisation. Uh, we thank you, sir, for giving us your precious time. It was enlightening to have such words of wisdom from you. Uh, and thank you so much once again, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Thanks. Anthony. It has been my pleasure to interact with all the viewers. Thank you so much.